We don't usually do talks like this. Uh, our boss's boss, Adam Boys, like did a pretty cool, colorful talk at Indicate West. Um, and he's a great sort of storyteller and just spins this interesting talk. And Brian and I usually do sort of the more gritty process talks. Uh, and I'm sick, by the way. That's why I sound awful. Um, but uh, yesterday we did a Q and A over in the other area um, to talk about the process stuff. We're happy to talk about that after the talk. But for this talk, we wanted to make it um, just a little more freeform discussion, maybe a little more philosophical. Um, so to that point, we have two developers we're working with. Uh, Rami, who you probably know from a talk elsewhere before, or has many awesome games. Um, and we're currently working on uh, Nuclear Throne coming to all PlayStation platforms. Uh, so thank you for joining us, Rami. Um, and you're sort of the, the experienced dev side of the indie spectrum. Uh, and then Rich, who actually we discovered uh, his game Earth Night in the show and tell here last year, uh, which is cool. And now it's, yeah. Um, and it was super gorgeous and eye-catching. We were like, what is this game? And then I couldn't find Rich. And then I saw him do a little pop-up talk. Uh, but he was sort of like, afterward, he left really quickly. I didn't end up talking to him until weeks later. Uh, but we connected, and now the game is running on PS4 out in the lobby. So please go check it out after this talk, because it's beautiful. And I'm going to show you trailers for the games really quick, too. Because and, and was also running on PS4 at E3, which is... Oh, yeah, E3 Rich as well. Got it up and running on um, PS4. And actually, uh, Chasm as well was one that... Uh, I don't know if James is here yet today, but uh, we discovered Chasm here as well in Show and Tell last year, and is now on PS4 and has been traveling with us a lot. So I'm going to show some trailers for the games real quick. Uh, who, who goes first? Let's do Nuclear Throne first. And Rami wanted me to use the most chaotic trailer of his... On so a if, giant screen, so... If you don't like really bright flashing images, uh, please don't look right now. Good luck. And this is like playing off YouTube, so we'll see how it goes. It's funny because if, you, if you've never played the game before, you'll probably be like, I have no idea what that game is. But I think it still probably sells the experience pretty well of like just really intense gunfire and music. And I have no idea what is happening is a pretty good summary of Nuclear Throne quite often. Uh, and now let's check out the Earth Night trailer, um, which I promised to caveat for Rich because he's a perfectionist and this isn't running at quite the frame rate off my laptop on this giant screen as we would all like. It, and it probably looks better the further back you're sitting. So. By the way, if anyone's in the other theater for the simulcast, you should come over here because there's seats here. Come closer to us. Uh, okay. Full screen. Oh, that toolbar's there. Thanks, everybody. So yeah, that's super beautiful. Nice work, Rich. Um, 
Yeah, so I guess we'll just kick this off. Like I said, pretty free form. We have a few sort of talking points for us. Feel free to yell out, I guess, if you want to join the conversation. We'll do a Q&A afterward. Um, and again, so Rami's released uh, a game on PlayStation already and is working on another one. Rich is working on his first PlayStation game. So we're just talking about indie development these, sort of these days in general versus a few years ago, how it is developing on a console, anything to keep in mind. Um, and we haven't like preloaded these guys with any answers and encouraged them to speak their mind. Um, so we'll do our best to answer their questions too. So uh, why are you making the game that you're making? Um, which I just want to put it in your court to give us some background on your history and um, why this game. Okay, uh, so uh, I'm Rami, one half of Flamber. Uh, we make arcade games very often. Uh, we've made some other games as well, but very, very frequently the games that we make are sort of games that could have been made like back in the 80s, but nobody did. And we think that's a shame, so we make them. Um, and Nuclear Throne is kind of a weird one, because if, if you've followed our studio, uh, Flying Bear has made a game called Super Crate Box, like four years ago now, five years ago, damn. Uh, wow. Yeah, five years ago we started, we made Super Crate Box, and then after that we made a game called um, Ridiculous Fishing, we did a game called Gun Gods, and we did a game called Luft Trousers. Crate Box, by the way, is where I met you. You were showing it oh, yeah. at, at IGF, I think, right? Yeah, that was. GDC. Yeah, that must have been. You were a lot less confident then. Yeah, I walked yeah, up I had and no I'm idea. Like, hey, I'm not gonna work at Your game is weird rad. Weird business cards that were just a sticker with a crate on it. Yeah, yeah it we we drew them there because we didn't have business cards. Um, no, I mean, th th you, you were not excited to be approached by Sony. <laughs> oh my god, it was so. That, I mean, we had no idea what we were doing. We still don't know, but at least now it seems like it because we've been around for a few years, and that's that's the only way you seem like you know what you're doing is if you survive in this industry. Um, but nobody knows what they're doing. If anybody ever tells you different, don't believe them. Um, That's extremely true. <laughs> and we all have imposter syndrome, right? It, sure. Uh, I do. Um, but uh, So we made these four games, and all four of them had something interesting. And then at some point for uh, in 2014, yeah, 2014, I think, we, um, we got contacted by, uh, by Mojang, who made Minecraft. And uh, they said they wanted to do a little game jam and that we should jam with them. And we basically decided to sort of take a few ideas from all of those games that we really liked and just kind of throw them together. And that's what Nuclear Throne ended up being. So for me, Nuclear Throne is kind of a um, amalgamation or like the sum total of like five years of Lambier. It's very chaotic, it's very fast, it has a lot of the, the design thoughts that are in our previous games like sort of mixed together and sort of purified into one experience. So Nuclear Throne for me is very much a game about what have we learned in the past five years and it's, it's actually really scary uh, to make a game that is supposed to tell you what you've learned uh, because on the one side we could have never made this game five years ago the other side, it's like, this is sort of, you know, we're really trying like to make the best game we can. And it's, it's terrifying to be making the best game you can because you have a very high chance of like sort of disappointing yourself. Luckily, so far, I'm really, really proud of this game. Um, so we made Dumb Traders, which is always fun. Um, and people can play it now on Early Access. Yeah, so the game is available right now, which is something that has definitely sort of like eased our mind. Um, the game is available if you want to play it on Steam. Uh, for PC, Mac, and Linux, uh, which means that we can actually see how people react and like base like base the game kind of off of feedback. We didn't do that thing where people say like, "Oh, you know, yeah, well, no, you can be part of our development process because hell no, we're not going to let like a 14-year-old kid that has no idea about game design tell us that our character shouldn't be a fish but like a mecha robot that's like three stories tall." Um, so we did we we did kind of say like it's our game we're making this game but we'd love to have your feedback and it's been it's been really exciting. Yeah, I, I love working on Nuclear Throne. I'm really excited to kind of have it done and see what it's going to be in the end. So I'm excited. Yeah, this is an awesome project. It's, uh, it's been really fun. Cool. Rich, Rich, why Earth Knight? Um, hi, I'm Rich. Uh, I'm the head of Cleaversoft. Uh, myself and Paul Davey, his internet tag is Madahan. I encourage you to check out his artwork on the interwebs. Um, we decided three years ago to make a runner game. There's all these like runner games on iPhones and iPads and everybody loves them. They're super popular, but they're, they're terrible. 
Um, they're, they're okay. I mean, some of them are great, but like there's no depth. There's no things in there that I consider like make a game a great video game. Um, so we set out to do that. We set out to do something simple, to do a six month project, and now <laughs> it's been three years. And I have like absolutely no end in sight. But um, Earth Knight is the sum of my entire life of video game playing. What do I like what was great? I feel like a lot of indie video games these days, and a lot of regular video games, um, are about like one mechanic, one gimmick that's like exploited, and and kind of like you run with it, and, and there's nothing wrong with that. But uh, that's not what my game's about. Um, Your game's about literally running with it. <laughs> yeah, uh, running to that dragon's wow. head. Um, <laughs> The, I think the mechanic's unique. I've never played a game exactly like it, but it's familiar enough that you know you'll pick it up pretty quickly, and it's not going to win any like this is the sweetest mechanic awards. But um, everything else about it is elevated. Uh, really the art reward. is all hand painted, frame by frame. Um, a, a lot of like comments on the internet are like, "Oh, I could play this on Super Nintendo." Uh, you definitely couldn't. Uh, each character is like 350 individual high quality hand painted frames. I mean, the amount of art in each world is absurd. We've been like pushing the limits. We're we're pushing the limits of what a PlayStation 4 can do um, for a 2D game, which is kind of crazy. Uh, the music is chip tunes, like made in original Game Boy. Um, a lot of people have said, "Well, if it's, it's this like new school game, why do you have old school music?" But I think we're pushing the limits on that too. Um, the music's by Chipocrit. He just put out a new album called Wordplay. Please check it out. Uh, it's got a full band. It's got him playing guitar and bass and my buddy playing drums and a Game Boy. So it's, it's again, this like elevated version of an old school thing. So, I, well, I think there's a lot of familiarities with like games that have been out there before. I'm trying to do something um, just like higher quality than has ever been put into something like this. Well, the first phone call we had after I'd seen the game here but hadn't talked to you yet, we just ended up talking about Splunky and Shadow of the Colossus for like 45 minutes. Both of our two uh, favorite games. Yeah. So I was like, all right, you're, you're, yeah, you're on the right track. Your heart's on the right, in the right place. Yeah, I, so I, you know, the Shadow of the Colossus mechanic of like pulling up the sword. Most people, um, and if you go out and play Earth now, you'll have like a little tip now because there's no good feedback right now on the dragon head. Um, go to mash as fast as possible. When you get to the dragon head, just stab him, and that's, that's not the way, you know. What have we learned from Shadow of the Colossus? Um, and as, as far as Spelunky goes, I mean, I I could talk all day about Spelunky. Spelunky, like, came to me in the... In, oh, once, God. Once we, I won't. I won't. Once we started... Can, we just, have a it, Splunk, it, can we just have a Spelunky panel at every event? Yeah, please get me in a Spelunky panel. But it's, it's, it's one of the finest designed video games of all time. And uh, it has certainly kind of steered my ship in a direction. So I'll leave it at that. As I didn't really introduce Brian... Brian works at Sony with me. I'm just going <laughs> to sit here in the middle awkwardly. Yeah. So, so, so why are you making the game you make? Um, I'm doing the thing I'm doing. Oh, okay. Why are you doing that thing, Brian? Uh, because we love working with developers. Because we're awesome. Actually, it's actually true. Um, um, d d probably for better context for both me and Nick is that um, Nick and I had, and with a group of people some of whom are also in the lobby helping work here. Those are a bunch of people from our, our crew at Sony that uh, really have you know, been doing all the work to change the way we interact and work with developers, but not only that, but also how we uh, approach the games. And you know, if you've seen any of our press conferences where there's a lot of games on those stages, that's Nick and I and an entire group of people who have a true love for, for digital content. Um, it's actually one of the weird things that we started stop saying indie games because we, games are games are games are games. You'll hear us say that, you'll hear Adam say that. We believe that games are games and they all can stand right next to each other, whether it's, you know, Destiny or Nuclear Throne, so. Yeah, and this also sort of wasn't quite our job to begin with. We used to work in a different group at Sony that would sort of look at all the third-party game concepts coming in and give the big stamp of approval or not, um, which it doesn't really happen the same way these days. It's much lighter. And, uh, so we, you know, we transitioned over to being account managers. So we're the first point of contact for a lot of developers, uh, but originally it's more just sort of a service crew um, to help people who have content on the store already. Uh, but we turned it into much more of an outward-facing thing where we would go out to shows, and this just started at PAX, I think, like what, four or five years ago or something, four years ago. Three. Uh, 
I don't know. I'm sure. Feels like a long time. I, it, yeah, it seems like forever ago. And, and we just sort of started crazy. moonlighting as this like Almost developer relations crew, crew and talking to a lot of developers, but having to hand them off to other Sony people to go through the process. But over the years, that just turned into our job. So now we can do that full time, and I can email Rami at like four in the morning with a question. Um, I'm probably awake at that time. Yeah. Um, no, but I'm. I, I, know, I, I know your secret email address where you'll actually <laughs> respond. <laughs> I'm. I'm actually super happy that you guys exist um, in the Sony like infrastructure because I remember when we started five years ago and it wasn't nearly like it wasn't anything like this five years ago you sent Sony an email and you just didn't get anything back uh, ever um, nowadays I can just find you on Twitter which is super <laughs> nice <laughs> yeah, such I, an improvement I, better I, mean, or worse. I, I think that we I, I, the, we do this job out of a, a sense it, we started doing this out of a sense of frustration with ourselves um, in a time where we had no one telling us we couldn't. Um, <laughs> That's always a good pretty reason. Important. Like, <clears throat> there was no one who was really paying attention to what we were doing, so we just went out and did it. And then when Adam came in, we said, hey, this is what we're doing. And he's like, I love that. And so, he's like, hey, let's put a bunch of these things on stage at E3. And we were like, wait, wait, hold on, maybe <laughs> too soon. But it was great. Yeah, um, so it, it's one of those... Um, you know, we were frustrated with ourselves, so we went out and tried to fix things on our own. And I mean, we I, I keep certain things in, in our office in order to remind us of the really, really bad old days of how we used to deal with developers. Well, that's the great thing too, is working with a lot of smaller developers and a much larger volume has really come back and informed our internal processes and old archaic Sony mechanicians and having to change all that. So these days it's way easier to get licensed and way easier to get development hardware and way quicker go through submission. There's still, you know, growing pains if you're doing it for the first time, for sure, and we're always improving it. But um, it's a lot better than it was when we started doing it, which is really good. It sort of forces everyone to change and adjust and modernize. So I came in fresh, I guess. I never had any bad experiences, but my experience Lucky was... you. Yeah, I'm, yeah, I came in with a good timing. I, it was just really smooth testament to this guy over here cool. um, with getting hardware. And uh, I mean, I think from the day we got our stuff in the mail, we were up and running on PlayStation 4 in, I think, like two and a half weeks. I think I only got it three weeks before E3. Awesome. I think my first experience was I emailed them in 2010, and I got an email back in 2011. <laughs> that was kind of... And this is not a, like, I emailed on, like, December 28th. This is, like, I emailed in June. And, I'm like, and you probably emailed a generic inbox, like... And then, in like, April 2011, I got an email that said, no, thank you. And I'm like, well, you should... You could have just like yeah. not done the effort to email me yeah. back. <laughs> and, at the and the time we probably yeah. didn't have much w to offer you. Yeah, yeah, no, th like it's it's <laughs> much better yeah. now. I want now I'm now I'm really happy to bring my game over. But back then I was like, no hell no, I'm not gonna work with these people. <laughs> Who are these people? Um, all right, I'll keep these slides moving. There's not too many, but uh, sexy Steve Jobs. I wanted to put on here because um, that's a great picture. What? And it does yeah. <laughs> It's, it's too bad, though, because, like, the way it's formatted, too, it, there's actually several more, like, inches below, so you can, like, see his legs split out, too. But um, <laughs> uh, So, especially for you, Rami, I think, where's indie game development now versus five years ago? Is we it e easier or harder? And in we all ways? still look like this. Yeah. <laughs> At least I do. Damn. That's not cool. Uh, Oh, God. That means you're going to be Steve Jobs in like 20 years. It's cool. No. No. no? Steve Jobs is dead. That's not. <laughs> what are you well, telling I mean, me? Like, we all uh, die at some point in time, right? <laughs> Damn. You're okay. old, Brian. Rami's so, young. <laughs> so, where's in, develop in the game development now? First, why is the question behind me? Uh, for I just read it to you. You were just too mesmerized by Steve Jobs to pay attention. <laughs> He's looking very yeah, sexy. Look at, Rami, look at me. Look at me. Okay. Where is indie game development now versus five years ago? Uh, is it easy, okay. easier okay. or harder <laughs> and in what ways? Um, yeah, I think it's in a... I mean, very obviously it's in a different space. We're kind of... We're kind of in a spot where a game is a game now. I think there's still... there's Like amongst a number of consumers, there's still like the, the big like divide between like indie and and triple a uh th i guess that's fine but i think we're like indie games are way more of a serious force in the industry i think over the past five years you've kind of you've kind of seen it grow from like being a thing that was considered niche because back then it wasn't actually niche like you look at it five years ago it's not as if in in indie games didn't exist like it was actually sort of starting to become a force in the industry i think what you've seen in the past five years is a lot of uh, larger companies start to take indie more serious, right? And I think 
Um, that is a really big shift because back then people were playing the Super Meat Boys, right? People were playing Braid. It's not as if this was like, well, suddenly indie games. That yeah. That's not the reality. Uh, but I think it has become a, a noticeable, significant force in gaming and in the direction gaming is going, um, uh, game development is going. And I think a lot of that has to do with sort of how the community build itself, like the development community. Um, all of that is just cooperating with each other. You know, there's never been a sense of competition, uh, at least not as far as I know. I don't know if you just fight with other indie developers all day. But no, actually, the Philadelphia indie community is like one of the most beautiful, heartwarming things <laughs> imaginable. Yeah, there's some of us here. Uh, but nice. Cypher Prime, who is anybody yeah, from Cypher Prime yeah, in here? Uh, cool. They they fostered this like unbelievable community in Philadelphia that's, I mean, there's no AAA studio in Philly, so I feel like that kind of changes the landscape, but um, everybody's super happy for everybody's success, everyone helps everybody I mean, else. even uh, where there are AAA studios involved in it, like Boston had a very good, like, indie AAA sort of dynamic going, like, it seemed the games industry is just very uh, collaborative, like, we, we like helping one another. We l if anybody is successful, that's good for everybody. I and think I think... We all, we all think that, like, if an indie game is a big hit, that is just makes people makes look at indie games more indie games, right yeah. so that's that's pretty great uh, i think i think in the past five years you've sort of seen you know steam uh, sony uh nintendo a lot of companies like sort of step up their game in terms of indie uh, even microsoft got up at some point and was like oh yeah right um so they're all kind of moving um and yeah. seeing those efforts and sort of seeing how indie is now a thing where Allowing games made by smaller crews that don't have the time to like sit down and do like 700 pieces of paperwork like because you know back in the days like back in the days here wow uh, when I looked like Steve Jobs um, You still did. Yeah, but oh, um, well, No, but back in the better. days um, You know the, one of the things Sony could do if you wanted to send them a game is just send you like 700 pieces of paper and say like sign all these and a AAA company would just go and hire seven people to do that, right? Because they could. And then we would get that and we'd just be like, well, there goes three weeks of development. And I think seeing the industry realize that smaller teams don't have time for that and honestly don't really care for that either um, has been the biggest development, I think. I mean, like the iPhone was there, the App Store was there, like all of those big, all of those big steps had already happened, it was just, was the industry going to catch up with indie eventually? And I it think... Thanks to Steve. We're starting yeah. to... Yeah. We're, I think we're starting to do that. I think that now independent game development is a lot more accessible. It's a lot more democratic. It's a lot more diverse. There's a lot more to do to make the industry even better. But we're, we're doing... We're on a path that I think is hopeful in general. And, uh, real quick, another big change in the console space as well, I think. Uh, because yeah, the f it's not like indie games didn't exist before five years ago, but all the big ones as well, you know, the great like early summer of arcade days, like those are all published by Microsoft. So until recent years, now you can self-publish on you know every console, which is great. That's a huge change yeah, as well, like on our end of things. Removing red tape. It's yeah, just removing which, like it's what Sony yeah. has been doing. Yeah. Well, and even back then, like you could publish, you could self-publish on PSN in like 2007. We just didn't have a team in place, so we didn't really like tell anybody. So you could do it, but well, that's, that's it didn't matter. That's not the same thing with you could do it. That's like you could do it if you asked the right the right people, right. press the right buttons, right. and then said like Sesame Open or Open right. Sesame. I don't know how you said it in American. <laughs> and like the right time at like 6 p.m. in the evening when the moon was full. Like that's, <laughs> now I, you can. I, I think Unity changed the game in a big way. I mean, it, it's a pain in the ass um, a lot of the time. Right. I'm going to skip like ahead to this one then. What piece of technology has had the greatest impact in your development? Yeah, don't, I, don't, I, okay, we'll just switch over to this one. Yeah, but I just mean like the fact that I started building a game for iPhone and Android and that I can compile to Mac and PC and that in two weeks of getting hardware, I was up and running on PlayStation 4. I mean, it has its downfalls. You can't do, I don't know, you can do everything, but you can't do everything. Some things are a pain, but just the fact that I as a small team can publish to every single platform at will is this huge difference. That, that didn't exist five years ago. I think a lot of that comes down to the same thing though. It's the red tape going away. Like the fact that Unity can build to Sony platforms and can build to iOS is just because the people that were not allowing that are now allowing that, which is 
I think that's pretty important. Like the, the democratization of tools has always been super important because the more people are making games, the better the games that we're going to get are, the more diverse they're going to be. Um, Unity is great. Is Unity Unity is older than five years? I was thinking about Unity when I was going to answer. Yeah, the but question. five years ago, Unity was not nearly as. No, Unity as was uh, interesting back then. Uh, <laughs> I still can't use Unity. I'm terrible at Unity. Uh, I'm getting better uh, <laughs> every day. <laughs> I think that's even my f even the best Unity users keep saying I'm getting better. Like it's just it's, it seems like Unity stable. Uh, I love Unity though. It's good, but I just I, I can't deal with like it being half 3D and half like coding environment. I'm just like my brain just goes like no. It, it no. also used to be really expensive to publish a console game in Unity, um, but now it's free. Uh, at least for our platform, we cover all the publishing costs. So that's something as well that um, you know once we sort of realized the ubiquity of Unity, we had to sort of catch up. But finally, we were able to sort of overturn that relationship or whatever, and now it's. You know, free on all of our platforms. <coughs> to just like go back, I guess one slide. <laughs> now that you need to go back, but the the other Steve. the other big difference, and it, it's part of the same thing. Like Unity has provided this democratization of game making. Right, the tools are cheaper and more readily available, <laughs> and there's more people making games than ever. The other big change now is I think it's harder to get noticed. You know, you're. I, I feel like a a little fish in a giant pond a lot of the time. I mean, we are. That's <laughs> yeah. guy. That's. It, it's, <laughs> Big secret, we're all little fish in a really big pond uh, as independent developers. But I guess, in a way, that's also fine. Like, a lot of people... It's cool for you, definitely. But I th <laughs> No, I think, but I think it's fine in that way where we don't need to be a big fish in a big pond either. Like, we need to get noticed at some point. That's, that's like, as independent developer, that's the one thing you need at some point. is for somebody to say, hey, like, this is cool. And thanks, then thanks, Nick. Okay. Yeah, but like that, that's important because like it's like you said, it's really hard to get noticed. The App Store has shown that. The, the just the ecosystem in general has shown that. Steam just gave up on that. They're like, we're not going to do that. We'll just make green but light. There, there's also watch it burn. Also, a few things you can do, like showing, just put setting up a laptop at an event in the corner and showing people, or reaching out to some press. Like a little bit of effort could go a really long way. No, uh, absolutely. Right like that, that's not. But like, there's always. So no matter what you do. You, there, there's this weird thing about the word luck that always like sort of pisses me off because it, it goes two ways, right? Like luck is not a single word. We use it, we use it in, in two ways, but we use it interchangeably and it's just incredibly frustrating and confusing. So you've got luck in like the, um, I was working on my game at 7 p.m. in the evening and an airplane overhead had like a malfunction in an engine and a CEO had a parachute jump crashed through my window, uh, saw my game, and bought it. Like, that's luck, right? That's, that's luck. That's one way of using that's the word lost. luck. That's <laughs> lost. I mean, that's lost, luck. Lost, well. lost, Sorry, spoilers. Lost. Um, and the other way is I worked really, really hard. I sent I send, uh, the right emails. I went to the press. I went to every event that I could afford. I tried everything I could. And then... Thankfully, somebody somebody noticed me. That's still luck. Like there's still there's still a roll of the die involved there. Like it's not as if this is a science that you can just get down and it's like, well, now I got noticed, right? That's that's not how it works. Anybody who tells you that this is the seven step program to get noticed, screw them. They're just lying. Um, that's the seven steps they took. Maybe it's just like I have seven steps I took. Well, I don't know how many steps it was, but like I took steps at some point. Uh, All right. Rami, give me your give me your uh, your piece of technology. Uh, Minority Report. No. Uh, that's, what I, that's what I thought of. That's, that's why I was like, this piece of clip art is acceptable, because it reminds <laughs> me of Minority Report. Um, whew. Piece of technology. Uh, we, come on, we talked about yours before, though. Does, does it have to be like hardware? Can no, it be anything. software? Twitter. Yeah. Twitter. That's the answer for you. I know that. <laughs> yeah. No, absolutely. It's the same color as well, so it fits. Yeah. Um, no, Twitter. I mean, I, the, the, one of the reasons Flambeer got noticed was Twitter. Like the, just the ability to directly communicate with people that wanted to play our games or that wanted to hear what we were saying, which was mind blowing to us that anybody would want to listen to us. Um, this is mind blowing to me. Um, but having that and having the possibility to just be in touch with people and listen to what they say and what they think and what they, what they want, uh, that was the biggest thing for us. And I think indie development owes like a large part of its existence to Twitter, even though you know, right now it's kind of a shithole. 
Um, but and, it's it's been really important. Yeah, and that's true for us too. I mean, a lot of the you know sort of makes our jobs easier. A lot of like of fans will see a Kickstarter online and tweet at Brian and I like, hey, did you guys see this? I really want this on PS4, and then we'll go email the Kickstarter person and we'll say, hey, do you want to come to PS4? It's you know here's the steps, and they're like, cool, we'll throw it up as a stretch goal or whatever. So uh, that's happened. You know, like just a couple dozen games now, probably gone through that cycle of people just pointing it our way that we may have missed or not seen for a few the more fact months that you're on twitter is kind of amazing though like i don't know if like i don't know if any of you like i don't know how much experience you have with console development but being able to tweet at somebody in a major company that's ridiculous it's great but it's like i've not seen that before. like id at xbox has one twitter account and it's kind of snarky and like i like it i can only talk about ours no <laughs> Yours is pretty snarky sometimes as well. Mm -hmm. um, I'm pretty, it's just us. I'm snarky. Yeah, yours, you're snarky. Not actually, like Brian is less snarky. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, that's debatable. All right, I'm moving on to the next. <laughs> moving on to the next slide. I forgot what it was. All right, that's maybe sort of boring. But um, really, why are you guys interested in console development? Because you could just as easily stick to, you know, stick to PC or mobile or. So it's like my lifelong dream to make a console game. I guess. Uh, uh, with my game specifically, we were originally targeting phones and iPads, but as we got further and further in development, we just loved it more, you know, on a big screen. And it's not that people don't have, you know, Macs and PCs going to their big screen, but like, you know what? I'll talk about Spencer Miller. My buddy Spencer Miller has a PC as his main gaming machine. I went over to his house. He pulls up Steam. He's got like 10,000 games that he's never played. He like takes 15 minutes to go through and pick the game. Then the controllers aren't working. Then it's like PC. Like and you just click on the mouse and like something goes wrong. It's just this like horrible experience. And I, and I game on Steam and it works. But like that seamless ability, like you click the PlayStation 4 button, it boots up like that. You log in. The game that you just played is right there. You click it, you're in. There's nothing else going on. There's no Windows update. It's just like that frictionless experience of, I turn this on, all I'm doing is trying to play a video game. I'm playing a video game. And like My that. My PlayStation station usually does update when I try <laughs> to do that. <laughs> so, <laughs> so PlayStation 3 you was should, really bad, you right? You're playing a game, your update. You'll never see I could have yeah. changed just the PS4 development specifically. PS, <laughs> PS4. I mean, PlayStation 4 is the sweetest console out there right now, right? <laughs> uh, I mean, I love my Nintendo. Hey, I love you to play after. those games, but it, it's 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 the best console. I don't have to say it. I I truly believe it right the wall. now. It and, <laughs> and it's uh, it's selling the best right around the world. And j the experience of making a game on it, I think, is unparalleled to any of the other big companies. And it's been well, an absolute pleasure. Thank you. That was uh, can I give much my more positive than I than I was hoping. Can I give my honor, like my honest answer yeah. because we could. Like it was just, it was a thing. It like it, first it wasn't a thing, so we didn't do it, and then it was a thing, so we did do it. Uh, and before, so you you worked with Devolver to get Lufthansa out. So the first time we did a console game was with Devolver, but that wasn't the reason we did that. Uh, the the reason the reason we did Lufthansa on those platforms was because we heard that it was possible now. Like the my previous experience with console development was that one email that I got in like April two thousand eleven. So I just killed the whole idea of like, yeah. you know what, console, pretty cool, it's cool stuff. I owned like an Xbox 360 at that time and I used it to play Castle Crashers when my friends were over and that was it, right? Like, I was, no, I was never a big console game. I was just telling Brian before, the, the first console I ever owned, um, when I turned like, I don't know how old I was, but I bought uh, Final Fantasy VII uh, on, a, on a CD uh, and my dad went and got a PlayStation for me um, for my birthday, um, but my dad is like Egyptian, and he's like Egyptian, Egyptian. So instead of going to a store, uh, he went to the black market <laughs> and uh, bought a poly station. Well, this is the literal black market, like a. It's the greatest piece of technology uh, for independent game development ever. Uh, it was basically a modded NES in a like casing that looked like a PlayStation. Um, so when he got home and I unpacked it and I grabbed the CD and I opened it, it had a cartridge reader instead of his <laughs> CD DVD dr CD drive. So, um, yeah, that's my console experience. So, like my so console consoles experience hurt you at the very beginning. It was just like oh it's God, just disappointments they, they, over, and yeah, over, over and over and over again. And over and over. Until it's at awful. some point, it was just like, oh, we can make our game for for that. Well, let's just do that. So we could disappoint other people. <laughs> so that they can have their first police station for. I think the company I think that company Lily is still making police stations, which you kinda have to give them credit for it. Like if you can survive in the games industry for like two decades making fake consoles, that's pretty impressive. Uh 
this one we can talk quick over. I just any you know any thing that new developers should take into account as far as uh, you know tips and design of console developments, and then to keep in mind if you know you're also going to be releasing on a console eventually throughout development. Okay. Um, if anything jumps to mind, if not, we can keep going. Well, there's there's two things. Uh, one is you have to think about the context of how somebody's going to be playing your game. So playing a game on a computer, playing a game on a mobile device, playing a game on a console, they're very different experiences where people have very different expectations of what those experiences are going to be. Now, it doesn't mean that your game has to be completely different. It just means you have to keep that like somewhere in the back of your head. Um, Nuclear Throne, for example, like Luftrausers was the first time I said it's going to come out soon was in 2012. I think it was in 2012. Yeah, it launched probably. in 2014 eventually. Um, and a large part of that, like I always blame Sony for that because that's easier. Um, but a large part of that is actually just that we had no idea what a console game looked like and how you make a console game. So like getting the interface down, getting the button prompts right, making sure that it fits on TVs, all stuff like that. We, we had no idea. We are just like, well, it would just press the PlayStation button, right? That's what they say in the Unity trailers. Just switch to PlayStation and hit play and it'll work. Um, but that's not the way it is. Like you have to, you have to kind of keep console, console players, the console context in mind while you're designing a thing. And the second thing is, there's a golden rule in game development that whatever time you think this game is going to take to make, like multiply it by two. If you're doing consoles, like add like another like one to that, like multiply it by three, because there's a lot of there's like basically a book of rules that like your average like I'm Muslim, the average religion has thinner books of rules. Um, and some of them are like just flat out absurd. Some of them are really funny. Some of them are kind of weird. The curse list is, is my favorite. The curse list is my favorite thing. Can you imagine oh just sitting in the morning and you get like an email from Sony. It's just a giant list of curse words. And we're like, <laughs> alphabetized. It's what? alphabetized. You can just read like, I won't say them. <laughs> oh my God. C is amazing. Um, <laughs> Uh, I had so much, like, I had to look up, like, half of them. I'm like, what does that even mean? Oh, my God. When I, when I got that, I've been just, like, read. Sometimes I just read letters to my friends. Uh, is that secret? I'm not allowed to do that. Yeah, it's fine. It's, 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 okay. it's, it, is, it is completely absurd. Like, there's certain words on that list. I'm like, is this a curse word? Like, is this like, a like word? Darn, maybe. Yeah, like, yeah, crap, I think, is on there. Yeah. And you're like, really? There's way funnier. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so there's a giant... <laughs> <laughs> There's a giant book of rules, and like one of them is like curse words, but like which only I, I think that's one? only for public showings, right? That's that's, uh, that's I don't know for like the demo kiosk yeah. specifically. Yeah. Which I will like, say too, as far as that giant book, that's something too that we're always working on trimming down and making less absurd. Yeah, you no, I, I, I think get that list. Longer, can you make man. it more absurd? Can <laughs> you just do like a weekly digest of new curse <laughs> words just for amusement of developers? There, J and, and J and is the best one, and that that list actually comes from like. Because that that particular list has to involve like we put retail kiosks at retailers all across the country, and a lot of it is from those retailers. So it's like a list of words that one of those retailers. Yeah. I just want to know who's deemed that's it I should mention those kiosks actually. It's pretty cool because uh, so it's you know they're in WalMarts and Best Buys and all sorts of stores. So they like to walk up and playable demos and trailers. Uh, and oftentimes the AAA guys don't really like bother to get it together to put a new, you know, brand new demo in it or a trailer. So we pretty much can put on whatever we want. Almost. There's there's uh, a trailer in those now. It yeah. To be a yeah. So there's demo. some really cool trailers and some really really weird games, way weirder than what you guys are making. That Octodad was on there. Octodad every time I was in the in this in the, the media marks, like the biggest European like electronics retailer. Every time I went there, I would turn on Octodad and walk away. Yeah. Just to yeah. like, <laughs> I like Octodad. I was like done. Yeah. Bye. If you've ever seen the Sports Friends trailer where there's different people dressed in different sporting attire. That, that guy might be here tonight who's like shaking topless <laughs> on the couch. Yeah, like the fact that there was someone in swim trunks uh, yeah. caused some concern and there was a lot of back and forth. But it's, it's great because like, every time we walk in our lobby, there's some of those kiosks and we're like, we see like why he Sports Friends trailer playing and we know it's playing on like a Walmart somewhere, which is fun. Yeah. It's um, a, I just want to know whose job that is. To look at all those. Like the, the, I think we would lift houses at some point. We, we had a fun one where we were talking about trophies, and apparently there's somebody in charge of trophies at Sony, which is like, 
That's a cool job. Like I kind of imagine somebody in like a big cylindrical room, <laughs> it's which is like a physical, like a with a physical trophy, trophy for yeah. each trophy in the game. And every time a game launch, you have to get like a big ladder and climb all the way up there. <laughs> Just put a new trophy down. <laughs> I kind of want to believe that. I'm going to keep it moving. Uh, any tips for approaching a platform? Uh, it doesn't just have to be us. This is, the, this is a giant monolith that represented what we were like six years ago uh, before we were Now it's like people. come to things like this with your game, right? Isn't that like the best thing I mean, thing to I, do? you're just trying to like sort of subtly suggest this is a PlayStation 4, aren't you? Yeah. <laughs> Could be a PlayStation you just, 3. You, you should have photoshopped in a blue line. <laughs> Nick, really nice PowerPoint skills, by the way. Just no, really thanks. This is really. Yeah. No, no, please. No. <laughs> um, you go first. So I made um, before Earth Night a bunch of uh, like little apps, and I guess one of them like did pretty well, but nothing ever really got noticed. And the the thing that got me noticed by a console was trying to do something truly epic. You know, something really big. And I know that's not an option for a lot of developers, but I don't know. I, I, I finally just like went all out. My six month project became a maybe five year project, which is complete insanity. Um, but that's what, I don't know, got me here. So go big or go home. Uh, so, so who of you is making a game right now? Who of you would like to be on console? Who of you are already talking with these guys about being on console? Okay, that that's yeah, that was the thing a big change between those two sets of hands. Uh, that's literally the thing you need to fix. You just after the stock is over, like don't let them get off the stage. <laughs> like tackle them, have your game on you, make sure that they can see it, and let them play the game. Uh, one thing that that I find r works really well is show them the game with uh, Xbox controller because there's nothing that pisses them off more, um, and then they'll want to have it. So that's good. Um, but no, seriously, like you just need to go and, and do it. Like your chances if you don't try are exactly zero. Your chances if you try are quite a bit higher. So just go talk to them. Like it, at worst you'll get feedback. Is that, yeah. I mean, is that just true? Of, uh, can that be applied to all platforms I mean, or is that just, just well, the, the, the good thing you, about you know us. The, the good thing about you is that <laughs> you can look you up on Twitter. So it's easy to find Nick Sutner because Nick Sutner is just one of the results you get when you search for like. Don't look me up. It's mostly something. like weird retweets of comedy. Oh God! Um, just Love search for like Spelunky the girl that and you'll find him. And rolled point. down the hill and like hit hit the, the, the tank and exploded. Oh, you that's so that good. GIF? I, like I mean, I I guess the thing that's common across all platforms is you just need to like well just you know you need to go and do it. You need to go and talk. You need to go and send that email. You need to do what I did in 2010, and then hopefully you'll get a better response. And if not, you'll just get to 2011, and eventually you'll get an email saying no, and you'll be able to make jokes about it 10 years in the future. Uh, and uh, pretty much every event now, I mean, like larger events, like all the PAX is and GDC and E3 and Fantastic Fest and Gamer Camp, like we try to be fairly comprehensive, and yeah. so do the other guys as well. But so you like can usually find reps from every platform. For the purposes platform of this crowd, everywhere. you're right here. Right. So, like, tackle the, don't tackle him. He's, right. he's hard to tackle, but you can tackle <laughs> Nick. Uh, you could also uh, consider growing a beard. I don't know if you noticed, but the people making the decisions at Sony, <laughs> <laughs> very the, big beards. You're on the stage too, Rich. So. Although we have, expecta but I we have expectations. I'm the creator of Beard Wars, free on iOS. That's if you true. Have a beard. Basically, whoever you are, if you have a video game, beard or no beard, it doesn't fucking matter. Like real beards, <laughs> real beards grow in, in your heart anyway. Like that's not an, it's not an external thing. It has nothing to do with anything. Like it's, it's in your heart, right? Like just get on stage and like ask them. And, yeah. and, and I think almost as much as anything else, like if you're at an event and you see us and even if you don't have something to pitch, just say hi, just communicate with us because eventually you're going to have something that you're going to want to pitch to us. I mean, I can't even speak to the number of people who we know but don't really have anything going at na you know, at one point and then come back later and say, "Hey, I want to show you this and this is something I'm working on." And you know, that I think that's probably there's a hundred also a good piece of There's a hundred ways to pitch your game. The best way to pitch your game is as a human being to a human being. Like so in the end, all business is people, right? And that I'm not saying corpora corporations are people too, because fuck that noise, but um, I'm saying when you do business with a company, find the people. And find, that, find the faces, the human beings, see if you connect with them. If not, just find somebody else. And if not, just find somebody else. Like you'll connect with somebody at some point that's 
kind of my hope anyway. That's um, uh, great advice and speaks to my next 10 favorite slide. Oh God. Because I got to look up Brian on, on Facebook. Uh, <laughs> and my giant cat. Um, so the hint that my hand is that we're people, not just a platform. So to Rami's exact point um, is that Damn. we just want to connect as people first. And yeah. <laughs> is that your beard or cats. your cat? <laughs> They're one and the same. It just flows all together. That's oh, yeah, it's like amazing. one long animal. <laughs> <laughs> wow. That's fine. I can, I can quit Sony now. I just want to put my cat on a giant PowerPoint. <laughs> All of your work has led to this. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I also just love that the one console I can see is actually an Xbox. Yeah. Hey, there's a... <laughs> and a Super Nintendo. <laughs> and a Super... Right <laughs> Every company. Right here. Sure you are. <laughs> Secret, Nick actually doesn't play PlayStation ever. Uh, never owned one. Um... <laughs> Anyway, we don't have to hesitate on that slide, but uh, <laughs> but yeah, just to Rami's point, like we want to connect as people first, and if we care about your game, it's not going to be because we think it'll like check some box back at the headquarters. It's going to be because we care about the game and we want to play it personally. Um, people often ask, like, what are you looking for? But we're not looking for anything. We're looking for games that we're excited about um and we just really want to help you put your game on playstation as well and let you self-publish and license you and loan you a dev kit and have you go from there um you know we have other programs as well that involve funding and marketing and other partnerships but at a default level we just want you to consider playstation a place to also put your game we don't want you to not release on, yeah. on Steam. And, and you should probably do that too and i think the other thing is don't don't be afraid to ask questions like there's an infinite amount of people you can ask questions off to on like what is the american phrase for that questions off you can ask questions i don't know you can ask questions no you can ask people though. questions <laughs> god that's not, that's the phrase that's yeah the you can ask american phrase. you can ask people you can ask this is why you came questions. to this talk okay. was to hear rami's sage yeah. advice you can ask people you can you can <laughs> 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 to see nick scott really um <laughs> but you can ask people <laughs> You can, I just, I didn't, I could see on the light on people's faces that you changed the slide again. Because it suddenly turned a bit more like red-ish. <laughs> um, but don't be afraid, like if, because he just mentioned like different places in Sony and different divisions, like that doesn't matter. Just ask him. And if the division that you need to be at is not that one, he'll forward you. If you're nervous about it and you don't want to like ruin your one shot with like PlayStation, a, there's no one shot, uh, unless you go and like try and shit on his shoes or something, in which case, that's probably your Sony career right there. Or just go to Brian, he'll love it. Um, <laughs> but go and ask questions. And if you're nervous about that, go and ask another developer and, that's working. And if you're hitting a them. wall, you might be asking the wrong person, and you should probably ask another developer friend who the right person is to talk to, because we ran into, even someone yesterday I was talking to it. Uh, emailed someone from Sony years ago, and I didn't even recognize that name. I was like, I wish you had emailed that person because I've they're definitely the wrong person, and it's worth trying as many other people as you can find. Yeah, so just ask other devs, yeah. ask the platforms, ask it, people. Yeah, I mean, and t to Nick's point there, we're a giant corporation, and that also, has, but also people. <laughs> yeah, we're people, but we're a gi like there. There is the ability to get lost if you go to the wrong person, and. There's no like, oh, I only want to email the, the one person over and over again. If you've got another name from someone else or you go look us up on Twitter and say, hey, I'm trying to get a touch you for X, Y, or Z reason, like it's, you know, the, it happens. There are cracks and you can slip into them and then you're in a void. But the best advice would be just to keep trying the next person down the line as awful as that can be. Or just you might not be talking to the right person. If you haven't heard back from us, like email us again. It's not because yeah, we don't, didn't don't for any afraid. reason. That's because we have like, I don't know, I'm sure I want to check my inbox right now, but like, because we have hundreds of emails. I mean, this, guess, is, so. this, this is, this <coughs> is. I mean, I mostly work with Nick uh, at Sony. Our, our standard method of communication is we email each other six times. Uh, because I get like 700 emails a day and he gets like a few hundred emails a day. So like very often it just sort of slips through the cracks of everything. So don't, if you, if you don't get a response from somebody, try again. If you don't get a response from them, then try again. If you don't get a response, then try again. If not, just screw them and go find somebody else. Right? I that's would say that's true also of, I mean, maybe press people in the room would disagree with me. I used to be press, but... No, that's true uh, for that's press well. as well. You gotta be persistent like, as, you know, yeah, without, without being annoying, but... 
No, you can be a bit annoying. Like yeah. basically, my, my golden rule with email, emailing people over and over again is as long as they don't respond, you're fine. <laughs> Which is kind of, it's kind of sounds like a weird rule, but as long as they don't respond, they don't hate you. If they hate you, they'll send you an email back to like, fuck off. <laughs> uh, when you get that email, you went too far. Uh, All right. But up until that point, just email again. Uh, probably going to wrap this up shortly, I imagine. So uh, this was a cool uh, slide. Um, so Kevin from Young Horses over there is on the Octodad team. Uh, and you guys just put up sort of a post-mortem blog post a couple of weeks ago, which was really interesting to see sort of the numbers and everything behind the success of Octodad, which has obviously been a huge success. So congrats to you guys. Uh, <laughs> eight, eight arms of applause. Um, but anyway, I thought this was interesting, and I think this was a great example. You know, originally I sort of wanted to make this talk about we want you to keep making your weird game because, again, we're people, and that's what we, we like weird games too, and that's what gets noticed. And Octodad's a really weird game, but it so happened to be one that at the right time was ready for us to also, and even though I started talking to Young Horses like four-plus years ago maybe at GDC uh, for the original Octodad when you guys were still students, uh, we sort of kept in touch and uh, Octodad the Deadliest Catch was ready at the right time for us to put on stage at E3 and make a big part of the PlayStation messaging, which was hilarious to us too, but everyone really likes it. It's just a lovable concept, so everyone really got behind it and uh, you know, we made like Octodad costumes and also Nuclear Throne costumes actually, which I forgot to put in here. Um, for the PS4 launch party actually in New York here, uh, we rented out the Standard Hotel and we projected images of games on the side of the building. So it was like many story tall game. And, and so we just put like fun, goofy stuff up there. So we have access to all those channels because whenever people, you know, are looking to highlight content or different opportunities within Sony, they come to us like, hey, what cool stuff do you guys have? So there's lots of crazy opportunities like that that come along. And sometimes like Octodata works out really well. Um, and something I'm proud of too, actually on this slide. Um, I mean, you can see, I think, that I, for me, I'm pretty happy with that percentage of units and you know sales for PS4. But actually, on the revenue side, uh, the pricing usually holds pretty well in the console space, which I like to see as well, um, especially like the longer tail too. So I mean, Lift Rouser's second best platform was uh, PlayStation as well. well uh, it was well, Steam PC first. Was it Vita specifically? Yeah, it was too? Vita. Vita was our second highest selling platform, yeah. which blew my mind, by the way. That was awesome. Also, I kind of, I'm kind of sad that you cut out the best part of this postmortem. Which is what? Uh, at the bottom, they had like a little thing that was like super octodad, where it just said Metacritic or like what was it? Awards, uh, significant awards one, and it just said, had like a laurel saying none. <laughs> yeah, that's super octodad. I just that's love that. that. Um, and, and and octodad like went into a whole crazy space, and that Shu fell in love with it. Shu Yoshida. Yeah, <laughs> and. That just like, like a weird, crazy, deep love for it. And it came out in Japan with a lot of help from Shu and his first party team to do a lot of work on it. They um, did a full in-game translation into Japanese just because the team loved it and was excited about it. So they just did it for them. 